little, little break. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, if you've looked at the web page, uh, you've seen. Um, maybe you haven't seen, but if you look at that page, what you will see is uh, under last week's material there is a video on t-test. A couple of videos on t-test. Uh, there are videos for the one sample t-test and videos for the two sample t-test. I just posted the two sample t-test video today. It's a 10 minute video and it runs through an example with um, a two sample, two sided t-test um, and then you get a result which is not at all satisfying. Okay, you know that the answer that you get is wrong. Um, just very briefly what it is, uh, if you've not yet seen the video, um, these are data from deer at check stations. That's there are 10 deer, and what the person did was measure the front leg and measure the back leg on the deer. And then, so you have a table now that has 10 deer and 10 measurements for the front leg and 10 measurements for the back leg. And the question is, are the back legs the same as the front legs? Is there a difference between those two means? So it's a simple t-test. Are the front legs different from the back legs? It's two-sided, okay, because we don't know, theoretically we know, but a priori we don't know which is going to be longer, right? And then you run the t-test and it turns out that there is no difference. Well, as a vertebrate biologist, I know that has to be wrong because almost all mammals, not all, but almost all mammals, have hind limb dominance. The back legs are longer than the front legs. The only examples where that isn't true are some primates and hyenas. Same is true for reptiles, same is true for amphibians, right? Back legs are longer than front legs, and it's obvious why. It's because that's where you generate propulsion, right? Fine. So you get this result that says they're not different from one another, and that's not pleasing, because I know deep in my bones that they are different. So what's wrong? What's wrong is this. When you do the t-test, you have t equals, and then you have x bar 1 minus x bar 2, right? So it's the difference between the two means. And you're dividing that by the standard deviation of the difference between those means. Okay? So that's the basic form of a t. That should look familiar, okay? Because that's how we standardized for the z score as well, right? The mean minus, right, one value minus the mean divided by the variance or the standard deviation. Well, that's what we're doing right here. So it's basically that. This is the part that is giving us a problem here. We're looking at the standard deviation of the difference between two means. Now, let's think about the legs on these deer. The front legs are attached to the same body as the back leg. So let's imagine you have some gigantic 12-point buck come in on a truck. He's a monster of a deer. He's got long legs. Now you get this little tiny doe that comes through, and she's tiny, and she's got little legs. You see the problem? In other words, the front legs are not independent of the back legs. If you think about this term right here, we can think of this in terms of the variance of x bar one, or we can think of it as the variance of x, let's simplify x plus y. It's really the variance of x bar and the variance of xy, but this is fine. What is that? Remember from our rules of expectation and variance, that was equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y plus what? plus the covariance of x and y. So this is the same thing here, okay? It's the standard deviation of 
a difference rather than a sum, but that's fine. Okay? So we're really looking at the variance of a sum. We're adding one with the other, and the other one happens to be negative. Okay, that, whatever. It's the variance of a sum. So it's the variance of one plus the variance of the other plus the covariance. Now, if x and y are statistically independent, that is, if knowledge of one tells you nothing about the other, then the covariance term is equal to zero. But if they're not, the covariance term is going to be non-zero. In other words, if, the, if x and y, if front leg and back leg are not independent of one another, and we know they're not, this is going to be non-zero, which means the denominator is going to be bigger, which means your t-value is going to be smaller, which means you're less likely to find a difference. So there's the problem. So the second part of the video says, hey, let's look at it in a slightly different way. We're still going to do a t-test, but this time, instead of looking at the front legs and the back legs, let's look at the difference between the front legs and the back legs. So now instead of having 20 observations, we have 10. And now we do the t-test, and we compare the difference to zero. And when we do that in the video, you just discover that, yeah, the difference is not zero. In other words, there is a difference between the front legs and the back legs. The whole point of that exercise is to alert you to the fact that you have to pay attention when you're setting this stuff up. Okay? You have to look out for covariation. And that is what's important and relevant to what we're going to do today. So look at that video, um, and what I want you to do for your homework, homework for today, okay, in R, okay, so use R, and you have all the code you need to do this, I want you to do two t-tests. I want you to take the deer leg data, okay, so deer leg data, which is on that video, okay, it's a 10 minute video, so it should be no big deal, the deer leg data, and I want you to do a two sample t-test. And then I want you to go to the next slide in the little video, or a couple slides later, and repeat the t-test, this time using the difference. So you should come up with exactly the same result that I show in the video. Okay? So just use your, your t-test code that you've got to this point, right, in R, and run those two examples, okay? Cut and cop copy and paste it all onto a Word document and then email it to me. All right. Great. Get this jingly jingly thing off. All right, next problem. Everything we've done up to this point is boring. It's kid stuff, right? It's the sort of stuff that, you know, that you would do in a, in a very basic sort of setting. Usually the data that we work with are more interesting, so we need some additional tools in our toolkit. And the first problem that we're going to encounter is this. It's rarely the case that we're comparing group A with group B. Well, sometimes that happens. For example, right now, if you look at all these COVID-19 vaccine trials, this is exactly what they're doing. They have two groups. They have a group that gets the vaccine, the test vaccine, and they have a group that gets the placebo. So they're comparing those two groups. Is there a difference, yes or no? Perfect for a t-test, okay? What if you have more than two groups? What if you have three groups? 
maybe we get to the point where we discover some weirdness with the vaccine and we need blacks, Latinos, whites, and Asians. And I'm sure I've left out many, many, many different other racial groups. But let's imagine we've discovered some unique differences in how this potential vaccine works. And we decide we really need to compare these four groups. How can we do it? Well, we could do t-tests. We could compare Asians with blacks. Are they different? We could compare Asians with Latinos. Are they different? We could compare Asians with whites. Are they different? We could compare whites with Latinos, whites with blacks, and whites with Asians. And then we could compare blacks with Latinos and blacks with whites. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that all of them? What am I missing? I've got Latinos and whites. I've got whites and blacks. I've got whites and Asians. I've got Latinos and blacks. I don't, I have Latinos and Asians. You have blacks and whites twice though. That's blacks and whites. Yes, I didn't need that one, did I? So that's six comparisons. If you ever get bored with your graduate education and or, and or somebody's paying you money to take classes, which happened to me, people paid me to go to school. It was kind of awesome. And you can take all these classes. And I did. And one of the classes I took was a class called Combinatorics. And all you do in a course called combinatorics is learn how to count. You count. Well, you don't count one, two, three, <laughs> right? You learn how, to, how many possible combinations are there of three things taken two at a time, or how many possible combinations are there of 55 things taken 18 at a time, you know, those sorts of things, okay? That's where you learn that kind of stuff. Why is that important? It's important in probability theory. You have to be able to know how to count in probability theory. So there we have six possible comparisons. Is there a problem with that? And the answer is, oh yeah. What's the problem? So the answer is yes. Now the hard question is, what is the problem? The problem is this guy named Bayes. Okay. We talked about ping pong balls in a hat, did we not? Have we not talked about ping pong balls in a hat? We didn't? I don't think so. Were the ping pong balls different colors? Yeah. Okay, I think, I, I think I've heard this before. I don't know if it was in here. We have a hat full of ping pong balls. Now, all I tell you is there are ping pong balls in this hat. And I walk up to you and say, you can't see what's inside the hat. I just tell you there are ping pong balls in there, and I don't tell you how many. And I ask you, what's the probability that you're going to pull out a red ping pong ball? You have no idea. You're totally naive. OK? So you pick one out, and it's blue. You now know something about the system. What you know is that there is at least blue inside that hat. So the probability of getting a blue ball is non-zero. And I now go up to the next student and say, all right, what's the probability of getting a red ball? You're not really sure. You pull a ball out, and it's red. So now you know there are at least blue balls in the hat and red balls. I now go up to the third student and say, what's the probability of getting a red ball. And you're going, well, so far it's 50-50. So you're probably going to say 0.5. You pull out a ball and it's yellow. 
And now you know there are these three colors in there. So now I go to the fourth student, and the fourth student goes, well, it might be 30 33%, right? So in other words, every time you do this, the probability of getting the right answer changes. The more knowledge you have about the system, right, the better your estimate of what the true probability is going to be. The reason that's important here is because of this. Let's imagine we do this test and we discover it's either different or not. We now have knowledge about the system. Now we're doing another test. We already know something about the system. The probabilities have changed. The probability of getting the right answer is now different. With each additional test we do, the probability of getting the right answer has changed. The probability numbers, the, the numbers in the table that you look up, those things haven't changed. But the true probabilities have. That's the point. So the more knowledge you have of the system, right, those probabilities become different. And we have to protect ourselves against that. Well, the way we do that, the easiest way to do that, is by using something called a Bonferrani adjustment. Bonferrani adjustment. And what happens in a Bonferrani adjustment is you take your alpha value and you divide it by the number of pairwise comparisons. So if you're, if you're doing two pairwise comparisons, and your alpha value is 0.05, you're going to divide 0.05 by 2. So now, in order to maintain a 5% probability, or a 95% probability of getting the right answer, instead of using your cutoff value as alpha as 0.05, you now have to use alpha of 0.025. And using alpha of 0.025 guarantees you that your true alpha value is really going to be 0.05. So by the time you get to 6, or 10, or 20, or 50, you realize that alpha value that you're going to look up in the table gets insanely small. Okay? In other words, we're losing statistical power. And that's what we want to maintain. We want to maintain statistical power. So how do we do it? How can we set this up so that we can do all of these comparisons at one time without cheating, without peaking. See, see, there's the problem. Every time you pull out your data set and you start thinking around with it, looking at it, hey, let me just compare bunnies and armadillos just for grins and giggles, see what happens. Are they different? And later on, oh, let's compare white bass with Asian carp, you know? just for grins and giggles. And then you just keep it every day. And now you finally have all your data together and you're starting to look at your data. You already know something about the data. The p-values have changed. You don't tell anybody. You go ahead and use the regular published p-values. Nobody knows that you've cheated and looked at your data. But the true, the true values are different. The result that you get is wrong. Okay? So we need a way to do it where we don't cheat. That's one of the reasons for doing box plots. When you do box plots, we're not computing any parameters, so we're not really cheating. Okay? How can we do this? What are, we want to compare all groups at the same time. Let's imagine we have group A, group B, group C, and group D. We want to compare those four groups. How should we do it? Ideas. What 
What should we look at? So we put up some box plots. Yeah, good. Okay, I like box plots. I love box plots. I'm famous for box plots. I'm the first person ever to publish box plots in the Journal of Mammalogy. See, I'm famous. <laughs> Maybe one treatment is, maybe these are fertilizer treatments. Maybe this is a control. And this is, I don't know, what kind of fertilizer. Maybe it's, you know, got, what is, what's K? Potassium? If we got a phosphate in there, what is that? P2O5? What, what's that? It should be PO4. P2, PO, just PO4? That's not right. Maybe another nitrogen compound. Yeah, it's PO4 uh, 3 minus. Oh, no, don't get all chemical. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't like chemistry. I hated chemistry. I had two years of organic chemistry and hated every damn bit of it. You know? <laughs> All right, we're just going to put K, P, and N, okay? That works. Good. So we have, we have these four treatments, okay? Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply this fertilizer to our fields. I don't know, we'll have six fields. And in each field, how should we set this up? We've got four treatments. And we're going to apply this treatment to six feet. Each treatment gets applied to six fields. So we're going to have 24 total fields. Okay? Each field is maybe one acre. So we're going to take 24 acres out of our land and we're going to, I don't know what we're going to grow, tomatoes or corn or mm -hmm. soybeans or milo or something. And we're going to apply this fertilizer, the, the, the right fertilizer to each field. So here, how should we do this? Should we put all of all the fields right next to one another? Probably not. What would happen if we did? Each field is an acre. Let's take Okay, we're just going to do our fields like that. And then we'll assign treatments. What's the problem if, if we do it this way? If all your A's are right next together, it might be the field that you're working on? Yeah, so this is going to be C for control. C, 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 C. You might have other treatments leak into or contaminate other uh, acres. Hey, so how are we going to apply this fertilizer? Spray it. So we're going to spray it. It's a windy day and some of this stuff goes over here. Mm -hmm. Or we'll apply it to the ground, and then it rains. So some of this, it's a slight downhill slope. Some of, the, some of this could, and or it's on a slope, and or this part's a little shadier than that, and or this is slightly downhill and gets more moisture. Who knows what? So there's going to be some noise in that system related to other sorts of things. So we're going to get some yield. Y for yield, okay? What determines the yield that we get? The number of tomatoes grown? Uh, biomass. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're, yeah, that's what we're gonna measure. Somehow we're gonna measure the biomass, right? But what determines the biomass that we're gonna get? Dry weight. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, fine, and we'll, we'll dry them all exactly the same. But from the point of view of this plant that's growing, what's determining how big it gets? Well, the amount of sunlight, mm -hmm. right? 
plus okay. whatever the fertilizer was. Rainfall. Rainfall. All kinds of things are going to come mm -hmm. into play. But there's going to be some effect there of the treatment, right? Yeah. So treatment. Anything else? Actually, it's going to be some mean value plus some treatment effect Anything else? I mean, across the whole damn thing, we're going to collect all these plants, try and measure the biomass that we get. We come up with some average biomass. Maybe potassium is the best one, and we expect that we're going to get the most biomass there. Okay? Fine. So some of this value right here, the response that we get, is going to be a function of the treatment. Maybe the control gives you the least. So there's going to be some treatment effect in there. Anything else? Maybe a bunny rabbit came by, and it was coming from this corner over here, just moving through, and was nibbling on plants as he went through didn't make it to those fields up there, and just by chance, and or some feral hogs came through this way and screwed up the field. And or there was a freak shear wind event, and all these plants up here got blown down. All sorts of things could happen. Mm -hmm. How is that going to influence the result? What is that? When that happens, what is that? All right. How many of you guys, why well, you're all too damn young? It's a problem with you people. You're all so effing young, you know? At some point, you're going to get old and gimpy, and you're going to be making regular visits to a physician. They're going to take your blood pressure and your body weight and all that. And you go in. And to make sure that you have the best physical exam you can possibly have, the night before, you just go out and get blotto. Okay? You just drink yourself into oblivion and eat like five supersized burritos from Burritoville, and then you, you know, have a couple of pizzas for you know after for a midnight snack or something, and maybe half a gallon of ice cream and a six pack of you know Budweiser or something like that. Good God, how large is this person's stomach? <laughs> oh, it's going to be glorious. It'll be great. And the next morning when you go in to see your physician, you're in your best possible shape. They put you on the scale and you're like 12 pounds heavier than you normally are. And then he takes your blood pressure and your blood pressure is off the, you know, just off the charts and whatnot. Is that what you typically are? No. 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 Okay. What's that called? Deviation. Some kind of deviation from the normal, right? But why is it there? It's there because you ate all that stuff and drank all yeah. that stuff, yeah, right? Well, a food vendor. Yeah, you did. Okay. So you catch it. You catch a fish. And you measure the length of the fish. And say, yeah, th this fish is 27 centimeters long, okay? You catch the fish three days later, and he's only 24 centimeters long. Same damn fish. You know it because you tagged him. Why on the first day he's 27, and a couple of days later he's only 24? Did he shrink? What happened? Same, same damn fish. What happened? Whoever measured it, measured it wrong. One of the you made a mistake when you measured it. Okay. What's that called? Error. Error. Okay. It's error. Those pigs moving through 
are causing error in your data. The bunny rabbit is causing error. Overspray is causing error. So plus, to this, we're going to add error. Okay? That's all. Great. Now, let's think about how we can do this. What we're really thinking about is the variation. Okay? What we really think about is how much variation is here and how much variation is there. Okay? y equals u plus alpha plus epsilon. There's our model. Okay? So the yield that you get is going to be equal to the average plus some kind of treatment effect plus some white noise, some error. So this is what I'm mean when I say, what is the ANOVA, the analysis of variance model? And that's what we're going to do. We're going to analyze the variance. So how can we set this up? Let's think back to our 24 fields. How should we organize our 24 fields? So there you are. You're working on your, on your wood roaches. Mm -hmm. Okay? You say, all right, I have to do this really difficult thing. I have, to, I have to go in and very carefully measure the bite force on the jaws of this wood roach. Okay? And I know where I can get some wood roaches out of Shiva's wood pile. So you come out to my house and you scavenge through my wood pile and you collect 20 or 30 wood roaches. You take them in the lab, and this is the first time you've ever done it, so you're measuring the bite force. You're not holding it right, you're not stimulating the little guys right, you're not ticking them off enough or whatever. You, but you finally figure it out. But you've got your first data. And now, you say, okay, now I'm going to go over to Judd's place and get a bunch of wood roaches from his garage or something. And now you get those guys. Now you're a little bit better. So now you're still recording and you know how to get them to bite and you know exactly how to hold the little instrument. You're better at it though. What's different between those two groups? Well, one difference is location. One came from down here, the other one came from Herculaneum. Okay? What else is different? The other thing that's different is when you got them from Herculaneum, hey, you were pretty good at getting those measurements. Now you do the test and you discover there's a difference. Great. Is the difference there because of location, or is the difference there because of your method? You figured it out. By the time you got to Tim Judd's place, that error term was pretty small. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's what we're okay. trying to get at. So how do we do it? Here we have these fields. I don't know, here we have 100 acres. Okay? We want to take 24 of these acres for our little study here. We've got 100. How should we put these eight? This whole field is going to be whatever it is, soybeans. Maybe we're working on soybeans. The whole damn thing is going to be soybeans. But we're going to take 24 of those acres out of these 100 and designate those acres for a little study. How should we do it? Randomly distribute the soybeans. Yeah. What? You mean the treatments? Oh, uh, the. Oh, yeah, the treatments. The, the treatments. Yeah, yeah. So we'll mark this whole thing off. Or maybe we'll have GPS coordinates or something like that, whatever. 
We're going to say, okay, at random, we're going to choose a treatment and we're going to choose a location. So at random, the first one is a control. And it's going to go to coordinates A3. A3. So there's the first field right there. At random. The next one, oh, that one's going to be nitrogen. And that's going to go to C2. That goes right there. Okay? We're going to do it like that. We're going to randomize the sequence. What that does, okay, when we randomize that sequence, what we're guarding against is the fact that all the ends were together and they all got nailed by the pigs. And all the all the K's are together and they get hit by the squirrel. We're protecting ourselves against that. Okay? The overspray isn't always on the C group. The overspray might, might now be on all the groups somehow. We're protecting ourselves against that. Having said that, how are you going to select these things at random? How to do it? Very first time, I, I took a course once in sample theory. That's a class where you learn how to put together samples, how, how to make a sample, and right? And the guy that was teaching the course was from India. And this guy was really good. And he says, okay, well, so what shall we do? And I raised my hand, just like some epic doofus. I said, yeah, man, well, we want to take a random sample. And everybody in the class starts laughing. Good. <laughs> because, yeah, dope, of course it's going to be random. What the, hell, what the fuck do you think it's going to be? Yeah, it's random. Um, the question is, how do you get it to be random? That's the hard part. Okay? So this whole course, this four credit hour course over 16 weeks was all about how you get a random sample. We're biologists. We're not doing questionnaires for the general public or anything of that sort. We'll learn a few tricks about that stuff a little bit later in this semester, but for right now, we can consult a random number table. You probably have in Excel a random number generator. Yeah. Except it's not a random number generator. They call it a random number generator, but it isn't. Um, I know there are uh, labs, there are a few labs around the world that are working on using um, like quantum uh, quantum computers to make to, to actually generate truly random numbers. Uh, but that's not exactly accessible. Yeah. Isn't it usually <laughs> determined by your I think it's like your computer's <clears throat> clock? They, they, they try to use all sorts of little tricks yeah. to make it truly random. And to this point, you can't. You can't with a computer. Uh, because if you, if you, even you take a nice random number table, if you get deep enough into that table, you can figure out what the pattern is. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's not pattern free. That, and that honestly is kind of a little, getting a little sidetracked, but that kind of begs the question whether randomness actually exists. Yeah, but yeah. That's, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. That, that's kind of <laughs> the philosophy to put yeah. that. So, so we're, we're going to come back to that a little mm -hmm. bit, but for right now, we're just going to assume that we can get this nice random randomization scheme. Great. So we've now assigned our plots here at random. We've grown these things. We've applied our treatments. We've collected our data, and now we want to analyze our data. All right, awesome. This is the best stuff, man. How do we do it? How do we do this? We know, we know what the basic model is going to be. The basic model is going to be y equals mu, mu plus alpha plus epsilon. where mu or alpha 
is going to be the treatment effect. Okay? So we harvest all these plants and we go out there and we compute what the mean is. Okay? And we determine that the mean is that much. There's our X bar, our average yield. Sort of slopes up. Pretend that it's nice and horizontal. Okay? All right. Now we're going to go out and we get all the, all the plants from our control groups and measure them. And they have an average weight of about like that. And for the potassium, they have an average weight of about like that. And for the, and for the phosphates, they have an average weight of like that. And for the nitrogen, perhaps they have an average weight like that. Now what? Now John takes a sip of coffee as he ponders the meaning of the cosmos takes his mask off, violating all basic principles of the institution. I'll turn around. Oh, damn, that's good. All right, what do we do? What, do, what other information do we need? Uh, air. Yeah. So, well, let's look at where the observations are within each group. So for A, we have something like that. For B, for C, and for D, or for the nitrogen group. Let me get rid of these A, B, C's, and D's. And just go with C, K, B, and N. All right. Mm -hmm. Are they different? So when I was in your position, I was, I uh, can't even remember the guy's name. I, they, they, for my PhD, they required that I take a course in biometry. And it was a plug and chug course. So you, you just showed up and the guy says, okay, when you do this, you put this number in here, this number in here, this number in here, and he gives you this answer and there you go, goodbye. That was it. And I never understood why, what's, in, what's really happening. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you. I want you to understand what you're really doing. I'm less interested in everything else. What I care about is that you have a good concept of here of exactly what you're doing. And if you know, you know conceptually what it is you're trying to do, everything else is easy. The hard part is knowing what the test is doing. We know that about the t-test, right? We're comparing, you know, where you are and the confidence intervals and all of that. Now we're taking a slightly different approach, okay? So look at, there are your results. Are they different, yes or no? What's your gut tell you? Not really. How can we do it? Let's, let's draw three different scenarios, shall we? Scenario A, scenario B, and scenario C. Here's the mean. each case. Okay? So let's put up some possible results. Here's one result. Let's see, we have C, K, 
N and P, C, K, and I guess that's not exactly what we had last time, that's all right. Okay, so here I've got this, C, K, N, and P, my observations look like this. says this one Scenario A, Scenario B, Scenario C. Which one do you like? C. C. You like C. What's wrong with A? Uh, the data is just... What a noise yeah. in the system, right? It's just spread out all over the darn it, place. It means nothing. Garbage. What's wrong? Nice and tight here at B. Yeah. Yeah, but the means are too close together. Okay. Yeah. See, so you recognize that this is the one where you find yeah. that's different. Mm -hmm. See, you guys understand this. Now, here's the trick. I want you to express the difference between A, B, and C using a single number. screams as we push it. <laughs> I want one number that, ex that expresses the difference between those four groups. I'm pretty sure it looks the same from over here. Yep. Yeah. yeah. How can we do it? What should we do, man? We need a number. We want one number that explain, that expresses the difference between those three groups. Point nine five. Point nine five. Well, that yeah, that's uh, we'll use that as our as our point oh five as our alpha value. Okay, that's good. How do we how do we get to the point oh five? Yeah, so turn these things into point into something that you compare to 0.05. All right, well, you know, you know a big part of it, right? You know y equals mu plus alpha i plus epsilon i j. So you have y i j is equal to that. So y i j, the i observation in the jth group okay, is equal to the overall mean plus 
the treatment effect for the ith treatment, right? And then epsilon ij is something. All right. I do I have to be on in order to get all this on video? I think I have to be on this side over here. There's the mean, mm -hmm. there's the treatment mean, and there's my observation. Okay? So, this is yij. There's yij right there. Yeah. Okay. There's that. Oh no. Yes. How do I get from there to there? I'd go like that, and then I go like that. That's what I would do. Straight line, always easier. Okay. So what is that? And what's that? between uh, your, well first would be the average and... What's that thing right there? What is that? Move this camera so... Here's our mean, right there, there's our mean. There's our individual observation, right there. What's that thing? Let's see, we've got our individual observation and we've got our mean. What's left? Treatment effect of the air. Yeah, the treatment effect and the error. Oh. Okay? <laughs> so what are these components right here? What's this? What's that right there? The difference between... Let's Let's take this equation. Y i j equals mu plus alpha i plus epsilon i j. Let's subtract mu from both sides. Mm -hmm. Y i j minus mu is equal to alpha i j, whoops, alpha i plus epsilon i j. So what's that distance right there? That's this. Okay? Yij minus mu is that distance. We have colors. There it is, right there. Okay? Awesome. So that is equal to this plus this. Okay.
well, you know, if this were uh, this were so those are poker. Your I think if this were a poker game, I think you, <laughs> I'd be rich. Okay. I got two things left. I got that thing right there, and I've got that thing right there. Which, which is which? What is that blue line? That blue line is this line right there. That's just the mean of each group that you've tested. It is. That is the, that thing right there, that's the average for the control group. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's the treatment mean. Okay? So this thing right here is the treatment effect. That's my alpha, which makes this what? The error. The error. So I have yij is equal to is equal to my mu plus alpha ij plus epsilon. Okay. It's equal to this plus that plus that. So that plus that. Easy peasy. Okay? How do you know that the top one's alpha and not the other way around? Like if I think if it was a um, if it was the let's say the average of um, K and it was above the mean of all the of all the different kinds, then it would be flipped. Is that right? So we we could ask every person in this class for their shoe size. Okay? Everybody says, okay, here's their shoe size. And then we compute the average shoe size. Where's the average going to be? Maybe the shoe sizes are 6, 7, 8, and 10. Let's make it easy. The average shoe size is 7, 8, 9, and 10. What's the average shoe, shoe size? 8 and a half. Two, two below it, two above it. I know that that average has to be in the middle. There I am, there's my treatment effect right there. Some of them are below it, some of them are above it. That's how I know that has to be, yeah. that distance right there has to be the alpha. If this were the alpha from there down to there, then all the variability would be above it, okay? okay? So the alpha is the is the difference between the mean and the uh, treatment effect. The the alpha is the treatment effect. The alpha is the treatment effect. Okay, the effect of the treatment. Right, right. That's what happened as a result of treating with calcium or with phosphate or potassium or phosphate or nitrogen or treating with nothing at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so how do we do our statistical test?
we need one number that shows the difference between these three scenarios that we have up on the board. We want to be able to look at this one number and say, oh yeah, that one's really big. That's the one where they're different versus, oh hey, that's kind of small. That's the one where they're not different. We have yij is equal to mu plus alpha i plus epsilon ij. Y is the value of the individual observation. That's equal to the mean plus the treatment effect plus the error. So here's yij. Okay, there's my individual observation. There's my overall mean, and there's my treatment effect. Okay? So there's mu. I'm going from mu up to the, treat, the, the treatment mean, and from there, I'm going up to there. So in reality, right, what I'm, what I'm really looking at is this. I'm really looking at the difference from here to there and the difference from there to there. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let's think about what we know about already. What we know how to do already is the average, right, the mean, and we know what the variance is. So the mean is the sum of xi across all i divided by n. And the variance is the sum of xi minus x bar quantity squared divided by n minus 1. Right, that's what we know. So those are the tools that we have available to us. And those are the only tools we need right now. Okay. Let's look at these things right here. These, these. these three scenarios. That helps. I feel sorry for the person that's not here. I don't think that helps. Okay, let's look at that variability. Let's look at that variability. And we'll look at this variability. Okay, so what shall we call that variability? What shall we call it? What is it? It's the variation that exists where? In 
in that group? That's the, the amount of variation inside that group. Yep. So that's the variation within that group. Okay. Okay? So that's the within group variation. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the variation that exists. Let me use a different color. Blue. Now let's look at the variation that exists from there to there. Or from there to there. Or from there to there. That too is variation, isn't it? What's that variation? So what is that again? Difference between the means of different groups. Yeah, so that's the treatment mean. Yeah. And this is the variation between the means. Between the treatment means. Okay? So that's the among group variation. Okay. So we have within group variation, and we have among group variation. We have variation within the groups, and we have variation between the groups. Now you've got it figured out, right? Mm -hmm. How do we come up with one number to show the difference between these three scenarios? Yeah, you are. You know it. You're a smart kid. That's why you're in grad school. You, you would, oh, wouldn't you just plug them into the, that equation? With that equation? Uh, we're, we're, we can use that equation to figure out what those numbers yeah. are, but then we'll, okay. So yeah, we can compute. We can compute the variation within a group, and we can compute the variation between the groups. But now what? So we need the total variation. Oh, we can compute the total variation too. Hey, there is that thought. All right, we want to compute total variation. We have yij equals mu plus alpha i plus epsilon ij, okay? What is mu, our best estimate of mu? For the shoe size? or beans, or whatever the heck it is we're doing. What's our best estimate of mu? size and I measure your shoe size and I come up with a number. I measure your shoe size and your shoe size and I come up with a number. So I have one average shoe size here and one average shoe size over here. Is that the over the my is that what mu is? No. No. The population. population. No. The 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 True average shoe size is going to be hers plus yours plus yeah. yours plus yours. Yeah. So, what's my best estimate of mu? Uh, I have one, two, three, four, six, okay. twelve. Mm -hmm. I have twenty-four observations. Okay, you take all. all I take all of them. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mu 
This is yij equals y bar dot dot. In other words, I'm averaging across all i's, across all treatments, and all observations within treatments. The dot means I've summed across that mm -hmm. subscript. Does that make sense? This is notation that you need. Y bar dot dot means I've averaged across i and I've averaged across j. If I say y i dot, that means I've just averaged across j. Okay? okay. Mm -hmm. Plus, now what is alpha i really? Uh, alpha i, that's what, your result. What's this one right here? I want to know what that is. Question mark. In terms of y's, forget about the alphas and all that good stuff for right now. What is it? That's your in-group mean. That's my, my average within that group. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be what? Well, well, wait a minute. It is the average within that group, but it's actually... Yeah. Yeah, so it's the average within that group, okay? Mm -hmm. So what is it? This is i equals 1, i equals 2, i equals 3, i equals 4. So what's that one right there? 